for this sermon was uh, was there was a technical problem, so uh, I'm re-recording this uh, series. So this series is uh, the start of uh, chapter thirteen and it starts with uh, "If I have no love." So we begin by reading: "If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal." And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As, prof- as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways, for now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So this is a reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 to 13. And let's, let's pray. And uh, dear Lord, we ask that you help us understand this uh, passage. That we may receive it with a humble heart, and that uh, your word, which goes out, uh, will never return in vain, and it will do your good purpose, O oh God. We trust this because you are a good God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, we begin by this uh, passage, and uh, I will. Uh, I have uh, divided it up so you can see I rearranged it. And then you will see that uh, if I speak in the tongues of men, if I have prophetic powers, and if I give away all I have. So there are three sections over here. And uh, why do we want to say all these three? Well, the reason is because um, these are the things that have been mentioned before. Again, remember, um, uh, we, have, we are not reading this in isolation. So this is actually chapter 13. And there is a previous chapter, chapter 12. So it's kind of like this. If someone shows you a chat message, and then for you to understand the context, or what do you do with the chat message? Huh? Well, you scroll up. And that's what we do here. So uh, we are reading um, 1 Corinthians, uh, the letter. And the highlighted ones are uh, chapter 12 to 14. And uh, in chapter 12, it begins by saying, Now concerning spiritual gifts, so 12 to 14 actually refers to uh, Paul addressing that issue. And then uh, chapter 12, uh, this is just a summary slide. Uh, we have the, the tension within the body. Uh, some members are saying, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. Uh, because I, I, I'm not something, someone, or have something, then I, I do not belong. And then uh, Paul also says that um, there are some who are saying, I have no need of you. So... The summary was, uh, we are one body with many members. It was God who baptized us, God who made us to drink, one spirit, God who arranged the members, God who composed the body. We are the body of Christ, and God appointed in the body our roles and gifts. So that's um, the very strong sense of uh, what the church is. And uh, before he concludes, chapter 12, Paul says that, uh, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. So there's something happening, uh, coming coming in. And uh, he says, I will show you a still more excellent way. What is that more excellent way? He begins chapter 13 by talking about love. All right. So the context for this is uh, the togetherness of the body. So uh, we could say, yes, 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 I agree. Love is number one. But... Uh, we may not have the same understanding of love because in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? What do I mean by this? We may think we are doing, we are love, and we may think we are doing the loving thing, but we may actually be self-serving. So, for example, we, we know of these stories. A mother wants her child to study, uh, to 
be a doctor. Pastor wants the church to grow, and the girl want the guy wants a girlfriend. Now, by itself, these are actually harmless, and it may actually be positive things. But I think uh, everybody can understand how this um, these three persons can actually be self-serving instead of actually uh, doing or feeling what they're doing uh, with love. So the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. So the heart is sinful. So how do we know whether the action is right in motivation? Well, um, you might think that surely a spiritually gifted person has right motivation. So you might say, oh, maybe a pastor should have right motivation, or a Christian, or someone who worship leads, or someone who has lots of Bible knowledge, whatever. Surely such a person has right motivation. And uh, you, what are you doing then? What you're doing is that you are evaluating a person's a bit, uh, character by their giftedness? I mean, is that correct? I mean, or their goals or their positions? Because you also are, we are too familiar with Christians who are hypocrites. So spiritual giftedness is not actually a good way of measuring motivation or intention or character. And the same way also with uh, church. How do we know whether a church is right before God? And sometimes we say that, wow, that church is growing or that church has, has uh, prophetic powers or that church has this, has that. And then we make this a conclusion that surely a gifted church is right before God. And uh, let's have a look. What does the Bible say? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, uh, this is uh, what Jesus has to say. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, they actually did prophesy, cast out demons, and do mighty works. So having gifts does not mean being right before God. And uh, it's... It's, this is not just talking about slap on the wrist. This is talking about being right before God. He's saying that they will not enter the kingdom of heaven, that they will depart from him. And he declares to them that he doesn't know them and they are workers of lawlessness. So they are not right before God. How can this be? How is it that a people who have gifts are not right before God? And the problem is that we have rank the gifts. Remember how we covered uh, chapter 12 and I said that the gifts are not meant to be rank. And, uh, and what happens is that um, all the gifts are actually, in a sense, equivalent. Can we say equivalent? But that's also putting a value to gifts. We're just saying that uh, the gifts are not ranked. Because I wouldn't say that my finger and my kidney are equivalent. I mean, they are both needed okay that's the whole body metaphor right the fingers and the head and the eyes and the ears i won't say they are equivalent i can say that they're all needed i can say that they are part of the body so what happens then is that um, we should not rank them and uh, and we look at gifts okay that's the problem. We tend to look at gifts. We say that, wow, that church is doing so and so, uh, has uh, healing, has, uh, has testimonies, and so and so. And then we get very, we think that there's something happening there, that the Holy Spirit is working there. But, but it's not true. Because uh, this church may have other gifts, but then, um, so one gift is not more important than the other. And people can misuse the gifts, so God looks at the heart. All right. So at the end of the day, what I'm saying here is that um, God looks at the heart, and our motivations are coming from the heart, and the gifts does not reveal the heart. All right. So if we say that a gifted church is right before God, that is not true. So how we come back to the question: How do we know whether a church is right before God? And the answer is, only God knows. And how do we know whether an action by a person or individual has the right motivation? And the answer is, only God knows. 
And you see, this verse that we have uh, looked at, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? What is the verse coming next? And I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. This is verse 10. So it is the Lord who can search the heart and test the mind. Okay. So in Psalms 139, Say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So reveal in me, O God, if there is anything wrong with me, and lead me talks about uh, a sense of repentance. If I've done wrong, then lead me in the correct way. So it is only God who knows, even, even yourselves, you see. So I'm not saying that uh, for God to know his heart, I'm saying that for God, help me to know my heart, that I may know my heart. All right. So uh, you want to reveal any sins, you want to reveal any wrong motivations in your heart, and God will bring to mind. So mom wants to wants a child, a pastor wants church to grow, guy wants a girlfriend. I mean, are these right intentions? Are they pure? Well, you ask God, God, if it is wrong, if it is something wrong in me, then reveal it in me, oh God. So uh, by now we have uh, said that First Corinthians twelve thirty one has the love is the most excellent way. So that is the the intro into the chapter, and then we have said that the heart is deceitful above all things, uh, because you want to love right, right? But then uh, we have a problem. The heart is deceitful above all things, and then we get a solution, which is search me, O God, and know my heart. So if we do this, then hopefully we can have, we can love properly. So now we look into uh, the rest of verse 1 to 3. So we have these three things. And uh, why we talk about speak in tongues of men and of angels? Well, uh, it's again something that the Corinthian church was uh, quite uh, keen on. And uh, they have used it to rank the people. So Paul is saying that, uh, so what? If you speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but you have no love, um, you are noisy gong. And next, he talks about prophetic powers. Now you see this, uh, this verse, uh, these are things that people want. The Christian uh, is, is uh, asked to, to seek these things, understand all mysteries, all knowledge. And, and this one, have faith so as to remove mountains. This is a good thing. I mean, Jesus talks about faith. Uh, the apostles in their letters talks about faith. By saying that if you have all these things, but you have no love, you are nothing. And then it says that if I give away all I have, I deliver up my body. So can you see there is an escalation, there is an increase from merely speaking in tongues to having all knowledge and having all faith and now talking about giving away all I have and delivering up my body. Is there anything more that a person, a Christian can do more than giving away all I have and delivering up my body to be burned, okay, to be sacrificed? Is there anything more that a person can give? And we can see that uh, Paul even makes the point, but I have not loved, I gain nothing. So, um, when you make that argument, right, it shows how important love is. Okay, It shows how important love is. Otherwise, you don't. there is nothing there. And you see, there is this thing over here. Uh, I am a noisy gong. I am nothing. I gain nothing. And, and one commentator actually said, uh, he can actually conclude it this way. I produce nothing of value. I am nothing of value. I gain nothing of value. So I thought that was a nice way of, uh, of summarizing this uh, verse 1 to 3. So if we look at that as the base, then we say, okay, let's, let's look at our, our example. Without love, what happens when a mom wants the child to be something, something? Without love, a pastor wants. Without love, a guy wants. So what happens when there is, there is no love and the person tries to do all these things? So let's say a mom speaks to a child and tries to um, get him or her to be a doctor. So you see, without love, right? Uh, let's say if it's yes or no, and then if if, uh, if the child becomes a doctor, but then there is no love, uh, the child doesn't receive the love, the mother does not express the love, the mom doesn't, has produced nothing of value, you see or not? And then if, let's say, the child doesn't become a doctor, again, the, child, the mom is left with nothing, and then the child also comes up to nothing, there is no love. If you talk about uh, pastor, and then uh, let's let's not talk about pastor. Let's talk about cell group because uh, none of us will be pastors. Sorry, that's too strong a term. 
Um, not many of us should be pastors, but many of us will be cell group leaders. All right. So that's again, let's just take an example. But it can be anything really. So he wants the cell group to grow. And then what happens is that you can actually have a very selfish intent, self-serving. So where the cell group leader is uh, seeking value for men, um, you want to promote yourself or because of guilt or because compulsion and therefore you do what you need to do uh, for the wrong reasons. But let's say it grows. Well, it doesn't, you, you, are, you come out to nothing actually because your identity is still based on what other people think. So uh, it is just uh, puff up. There is uh, nothing substantial in your identity. It is just, uh, if it grows, you're good and great. But if it doesn't, then you're nobody. So at the end of the day, it's just uh, vapor in the wind. It's nothing, right? And then uh, without love, a guy wants a girlfriend. So uh, again, if you try and say that I gain sex, attention, fun, etc., how can a relationship last without love? Well, a man and a woman can get can be in a relationship for the wrong reasons for a long time. In fact, there are many marriages that begin for the wrong motivations as well. So um, you gain nothing of value at the end, all right? But now, um, so if you have a girlfriend, you gain nothing. If you have a girlfriend, if you have no girlfriend, you also gain nothing. But you see, when you have love, okay, let's say we have love, and not just a sentimental, romantic, or sexual kind of love, but love as defined by God. Okay, love as defined by God. And with love, a guy, a guy wants a girlfriend. And you see, uh, if you have a girlfriend, and then you have this, this love, as the way I describe, and you, you, you have something, you know, do, you, do you see that? If you have the Christian love and you have a girlfriend, you have something. You gain something. And you gain as part of the Christian because the Christian belongs in the community of believers, right? The body. And then you, you proclaim together, okay? Together the body love is defined by God, which is what I'm doing. And you hear this. And you will hear this in the church. You hear this in the songs. You hear this in your fellowships. You hear this in your cell groups. You hear this in the... So you walk together with the young, the young look at you and they say, oh, I want to be you, what a pure relationship. The peers, uh, they support each other. And then the old, you have people you look up to and say, that I want a marriage that's 5, 10, 20, 30 years, 50 years. And then there's that walking together. And then you pray together for your joys and your sorrows. And you counsel together for your good, okay, for each other's good. And then there is this love in the body of Christ. So there's this community. You have a girlfriend. And there's this love, uh, and then uh, we are all part of something of the body. And even if we don't, you're still part of something. You see, with, the, with Christian love, right, you still have something. You gain something. With love, you have something. And then uh, with love, a cell group leader wants a cell group to grow. And then if it grows, you're still somebody, isn't it? You're still a child of God. Your value is not found in results or people's perception or anything else. And, you're, and if it doesn't grow, I mean, you're still okay. I mean, your value is found in God who is eternal. It's not based on whatever other people think. And then, um, with love, a mother wants what is best for a child, whether that's to be a doctor or whatever. So, so when she speaks, again, if it's the child becomes successful, becomes a doctor, uh, yes, the child can uh, be, be, be touched because... She, he or she also knows that the mom did all set off for her sake. And if no, then it's okay. The mom, the, the dad, the, the child uh, still knows that the mom uh, loves her. Okay, so I think this is something. I mean, at the end of the day, if you have love, right? Oh, yo, if you have love, there's a lot of things that uh, goes right, even if things go wrong. I hope you understand what I just said. The things will go right even when things go wrong. Uh, when you have love. So, without love, uh, everything goes wrong. With love, something will go right. All right? And uh, I want to make a point that actually the symbol of love is always this heart. Huh? But actually a better symbol of love would be the cross. Now why would... <laughs> there's nothing about the cross here. There's no Christ in this passage. So why am I introducing it? Well, because the cross actually de demonstrates the perfect fulfillment of love. When you have the cross, you're talking about the sacrifice on the cross. And, and we have, uh, I think, focused too much on the washing away of our sins, which is true. It is a very important part 
of the cross, washing away of our sins. But it's not just that, you see. I mean, that's why the cross is such a wonderful thing. I mean, it's not just washing away of our sins. The sacrifice on the cross is also the means by which we are brought into the body. Because the blood of Christ was shed, and therefore we are forgiven, and the Holy Spirit fills us, and therefore we are baptized into the body by the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. So that is what brings us together. And uh, it also empowers us, the Holy Spirit that is now in us, okay? Christ who is in me, it now empowers us to love one another. So uh, this love uh, that was demonstrated on the cross is such an amazing thing, such a great thing. And, um, and, and that's what uh, we really should uh, remember. And uh, with love, uh, we, what we are saying is that with love, we are with Christ. And that uh, all the things that I've said uh, is fully demonstrated in what Christ has done for us on the cross. And because of, uh, of that, we can love one another. Okay, So, uh, without love, you, you have nothing, you produce nothing. You, you are nobody, you are nothing, that's what Paul says, and also you gain nothing. But with love, as uh, I'm trying to prove to you, uh, when things go wrong, things still go right. Okay? So, uh, love one another. Know that love is more important than all the skills and knowledge and abilities that you may have. Um, so, love one another. And with that, God bless you, and I hope uh, this is helpful and edifying to you. And may God bless you as uh, you continue this journey. Next uh, sermon is uh, verse 4 to 7, and that talks about how God has defined love.